Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this unusual sitting of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. It's wonderful to see you all here, and welcome. I gather that certain things are now about to happen, over which I have no control, and so I propose to hand over to my successor, Lord Reed, who has some control over what's going on. <laughs> We come together this morning to say goodbye to our president, Lady Hale, hereafter Brenda, to celebrate her remarkable achievements and to thank her for the immense contribution that she has made both to the law and to this court. I'm delighted that there are so many of Brenda's friends and family here in court today, uh, including her husband, Professor Farrand, who has been such a good friend of the court uh, and of the justices and their spouses over many years, as well as being a great support to Brenda, I know, and also her sister, daughter, stepchildren, and grandchildren. I won't attempt to list all of the firsts that Brenda has achieved, but I should take this opportunity to set the record straight in one respect. It's with regret that I have to inform you that she has not achieved one first that has been widely credited to her. She is not the first barmaid to have become president of the Supreme Court. <laughs> Brenda's statement that earlier in her career she worked at the bar in Manchester was transformed, <laughs> was transformed by the media into the more picturesque idea that she worked in a bar in Manchester. Brenda was brought up in Richmond in Yorkshire and progressed from there to Girton College, Cambridge, where she was awarded a starred first. She may have been a party girl in her student days, as uh, one of our newspapers reported yesterday, but another two-word phrase associated with her seems equally apt. <laughs> Following in the family tradition of teaching, she then became a lecturer at the University of Manchester where she remained for 23 years, by which time she had been awarded a personal chair and had a very impressive record of academic publications. That period in Manchester included her spell in practice at the bar and also a series of part-time judicial appointments as a presiding member of mental health tribunals, an assistant recorder, recorder, and deputy high court judge. It also included nine years as a law commissioner, where she was both the youngest commissioner ever and the first woman. There, she led projects on family law and mental incapacity, which led to the legislation which continues to shape the law in force today. And as we were reminded in an appeal about surrogacy, which we finished hearing yesterday, she also served during that time as one of the founder members of the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. Full-time appointment as a High Court judge came in 1994, and five years later, she was appointed to the Court of Appeal. In 2004, she became the first woman to be appointed as a law lord. And in 2009, she crossed Parliament Square to become a justice of this court. She was appointed as our Deputy President in 2013 and our President in 2017. Clearly, she's a woman who cannot see a glass ceiling without breaking through it. <laughs> All these achievements and the personality that lies behind them have made Brenda an inspiration to women and especially to women lawyers. Her sense of style has reinforced her role as a figurehead. Her spider brooch in particular has become a symbol of swashbuckling womanhood. <laughs> An important aspect of her achievement is that she has not only demonstrated that an outstanding woman can rise to positions which were previously held by outstanding men. She's also used the positions which she has achieved in order to bring about developments in the law, particularly in family law, mental health law, and the law relating to equality and non-discrimination, which benefit the lives of large numbers of men and women and children 
who will never play a prominent role in public life, but whose lives can be improved through the efforts of those who do. Brenda was an enthusiastic supporter of the creation of this court and chaired the panel which decided how new artwork could be incorporated into the building. Their vision was of a ceremonial route from outside where the curved stone benches had been positioned, through the front doors, across the entrance hall, and into the library through the new central doorway. There had to be a screen across the entrance hall to separate those who had gone through the security scanner from those who had not, and that screen was to be of glass. There were to be glass doors into the library and a glass screen across the entrance to courtroom two, which was moved up from the ground floor to avoid the noise uh, and distraction of the traffic. All of these glass doors and screens, symbolic of the transparent administration of justice, were to be treated as works of art and engraved with texts chosen by the law lords. The library presented another opportunity with engraved and illuminated glass being used to enhance the stairway and balustrade. The art panel also oversaw the design of the court's official emblem involving plants representing each of the nations of the United Kingdom within a frame which represents both Libra, the scales of justice, and Omega, the final letter of a Greek alphabet, symbolizing the final appeal. That emblem and its elements appear throughout the building, not least in the vibrant carpets. So Brenda played an important role in the creation of a building which itself gives symbolic expression to the law and the role of a final court of appeal. We and future generations of justices have reason to be grateful to her. As deputy president of the court, Brenda worked closely with the president, Lord Newberger. He is not able to be here this morning, but he asked me to say that he deeply regrets his absence and that he hopes to be watching us uh, live streamed. He also asked me to say that he thought that Brenda was a wonderful deputy and a great colleague, as well as being a fantastic role model and lawyer. Brenda's period of office as president of the court has been one of the most eventful, including as it has a royal visit and our 10th anniversary, besides one or two notable appeals. One of the greatest challenges which Brenda faced was the unprecedented turnover among the justices, with half of the court retiring and being replaced over a period of only 15 months. It fell to her especially to provide the continuity of experience which the court needed over that transitional period, together with a forward-looking approach to the court's future development. Her greatest achievement as president was probably her handling of the prorogation case, an achievement, it should be said, by all the court's staff and justices, but one which depended especially on her organization and direction of the hearing, as well as her role in the production of the judgment. Although it was produced under severe time constraints, it provided the government and parliament with clear guidance and will be of lasting importance. Brenda has been especially assiduous in the court's outreach work, leading its efforts to demystify what courts and judges do, to explain in an accessible way the constitutional role which the court occupies, and to educate and inspire the next generation and indeed the generation after that. She has also demonstrated a keen awareness of the fact that this is a court for every part of the UK. During her presidency, we have sat in Belfast and Cardiff, and she has taken part in countless events in Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales, as well as all parts of England. She has also been very committed to our work on the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, where we sit as the final court of appeal for many jurisdictions overseas. The Attorney General of Jamaica, Marlene Malahu Forty, Queen's Counsel, probably spoke for many when she wrote earlier this week 
to express the profound gratitude of her government for the service that Brenda had rendered as the law lady, as she put it, of Jamaica's final court of appeal. To quote from her letter, the fair and balanced manner in which you have discharged your judicial duties with utmost courtesy to counsel and sufficient sensitivity to the peculiarities of our national jurisdiction have never escaped our attention. As a judge, Brenda has a number of outstanding qualities. One, as the Attorney General mentioned, is her courtesy and also her ability to maintain an entirely neutral stance until she has heard and tested the arguments on both sides. Another is her versatility. Recently, for example, she wrote the judgment of the court in a case which concerned an area of company law which had become rather muddled following earlier judgments of the House of Lords and this court. Brenda is not a specialist in that area of the law, but her judgment of only 10 pages elucidated the key principles with characteristic verve. Another quality is her clarity of thought and expression. She has the rare ability to write judgments which are clear, direct, and concise, something which has made her particularly popular with university students. <laughs> the wider importance of those qualities was demonstrated above all in the prorogation case, where her clear explanation of the court's decision played a major part in its gaining public acceptance. Finally, the most important quality of all is perhaps her kindness towards her colleagues, towards the staff of the court, and towards those who appear in front of her. In that regard, I should mention especially Ayo Onatadi, Brenda's PA, and Penelope Gorman, her judicial assistant, both of whom have worked for her for many years. A distinguished academic who studies the court has categorized the styles of leadership of each of the three presidents that the court has had to date. Brenda's style of leadership was classified as that of a role model. She is indeed an inspiring role model to her colleagues as well as to a wider world and to the men on this court just as much as to the women. She has shown us by her example, day after day, how important it is that a judge should be concerned about what the world feels like to those who are vulnerable. She has demonstrated throughout her career that lawyers, and especially judges, are people who have the duty to do their best to make justice happen every day, the duty to do everything possible to make the world more just. We shall all miss an inspiring pioneer, a distinguished scholar and judge, and a valued friend. The Attorney General of Jamaica spoke for all of us when she wrote in her letter, as you proceed on the next phase of your journey, after such a distinguished career in, academ in academia, at the bar, and on the bench, may your joys be multiplied and may you be blessed with good health and all that is wholesome. Brenda, we wish you well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Atkin. My Lord, when I appeared before this court last year on the occasion of the retirement of Lord Hughes of Ombersley, I promised that I would never darken your doors again. I hope, though, that I will not be required to report myself to the Bar Standards Board for having misled this court on that occasion and that my appearance here today will be forgiven. In my defence, I would plead exceptional circumstances. During my time as Vice Chair and Chair of the Bar, I have dealt with a number of valedictories, including for Mr Justice Foskett, to whom I'm grateful for some of the material I'm using today, the President of the Queen's Bench Division, Sir Brian Leveson, and Lord Hughes. I've also welcomed the Lord Chancellor and the Presidents of both the Family Division, Sir Andrew McFarlane, and the Queen's Bench Division, Dame Victoria Sharp. I'm sure, though, that nobody will be upset if I say that clearly the best has been saved until last. With 13 days left as my term as Chair of the Bar, it really does not get any bigger than saying farewell to the President of the Supreme Court, and particularly this President, 
my lady Baroness Hale of Richmond. You never know, I might even get an accurate quote in the Times. <laughs> it's often a sign of the mark that somebody has made on the public consciousness that they become known by a single name. In popular culture, for example, Scylla, Cher, and Beyoncé spring to mind. <laughs> In politics, Maggie, Winston, and Boris have achieved fame, or notoriety, depending on your viewpoint. To the list of single-name celebrities can, I think, now be added Brenda. We who practice in the law have known for a very long time about Brenda, but certainly as a result of the Miller II litigation, the prorogation case, Brenda has dynamited her way into the public's consciousness. You, my lord, have, and those who follow me will, talk about my lady's contribution to the law. I, if I may, will spend a few minutes dwelling on perhaps the softer side. Lady Hale was treasurer of Gray's Inn in 2017. Many treasurers wait until they've retired before taking on the role not my lady. She combined it with her Supreme Court duties, not missing a step. It's a sign of her phenomenal energy that she brings to everything she does. And only last night, my lady was at the Temple Church carol concert, uh, raising funds for advocate and law works, <coughs> where she gave a reading. She made it her duty, whilst treasurer of Gray's Inn, to engage with the students at the inn, who clearly adore her, and I doubt there was a single student who did not have the opportunity to talk to her on numerous occasions during the year. But it was not just during my lady's year as treasurer that this happened. If you attend at any Gray's Inn event, which is also attended by students, you can immediately tell where Lady Hale is. You'll probably not be able to see her, <laughs> but she will undoubtedly be at the centre of any thronging mass of students. And it's not just the students who have benefited. My lady gives generously of her time to many different events. She always attends the employed bar dinner held at Gray's Inn each year and is also a regular attendee at the Bar Association of Commerce, Finance and Industry events. In fact, my lady attends so many events that I have also been at that I think I've probably spent more time with her this year than I have with my wife. <laughs> my lady is also the living embodiment of the Bar Council's One Bar Ethos having moved from the self-employed Northern Circuit Bar to the Employed Bar and now reached the very top of the judiciary. This year, I was absolutely delighted that she came and gave the keynote address at the opening of the Bar and Young Bar Conference. When she finished, she then stayed to sign what seemed like hundreds of copies of the book First 100 Years of Women in Law, a copy of which had been given to each delegate, and she then chatted with many delegates and posed for photographs. At one point, I wondered if we were going to have time for anything else during the day. Such was the demand for a piece of her. Her appearances at the Gray's Inn Christmas miscellany revels over many years are legendary. I'm aware that some people think that judges have green faces and pointy ears. Well, at the 2018 miscellany, the President of the Supreme Court did have a green face and pointy ears when she played the role of Yoda. Yoda, my lord, is a character from a popular series <laughs> of science fiction films entitled Star Wars. This year, she topped that appearance when she played not one, but two parts. First, a can of beef soup, and secondly, the part of Manet's barmaid. So finally, she has actually been a barmaid. <laughs> Surely Oscar or BAFTA recognition is now only a matter of time. Nobody, though, should think that she is a pushover. In fact, her fierce independence can at times, my sources tell me, be a potential cause of difficulty. The under-treasurer of Gray's Inn may or may not recount a tale, I have to try to protect my sources, of an occasion when he was accompanying my lady on a visit to the Northern Circuit. There had been a particularly good dinner the night before, and my lady apparently cut it a little fine to catch the train the next morning. The under-treasurer, fearing they would miss the train for which they were running, tried to speed things along by carrying my lady's suitcase. The lady's suitcase was not for carrying. <laughs> the under-treasurer was left with the dilemma as to whether he picked the treasurer up, <laughs> suitcase and all, 
or simply wrench the suitcase from her vice-like grip. <laughs> Sensibly, he chose the latter, wrenching the suitcase from her grip, and they caught the train. My Lord, time is moving on, and I will close, if I may, with two quotes. The first from a very junior barrister at Gray's Inn, who in a radio interview described Brenda as the Beyoncé of the legal world. I, my Lord, prefer, however, to think of Beyoncé as the Brenda of the musical world. <laughs> The second is from my 15-year-old daughter, Lucy, who's just been chosen to play the part of one of the barristers in her school's mock trial competition. As a result of that, she came with me to this year's bar conference, where she saw Lady Hale speak and also got her book signed by Lady Hale. I asked my daughter what Lady Hale meant to her, and she said this, an inspiration, a role model, and truly captivating is the best way to describe Baroness Hale. Her passion for encouraging women in law has made me think about coming to the bar. I pause to point out the obvious, that it would appear that nothing her father has so far done at the bar <laughs> has had that effect. She went on, I was amazed by her knowledge of the society around her and I admire her hugely. My Lord, I don't think I can do much better than that. My Lord, we will, we will miss Lady Hale. I mean no disrespect when I say, my lord, that you have the biggest of small boots to fill. <laughs> May I wish you, my lord, and all the justices of the Supreme Court well for this brave new brenderless world that you are now entering. And may I, on behalf of the Bar of England and Wales, uh, wish my lady, her husband Julian, and their family the very best for the future. I'm sure we will not have heard the last from you, my lady. I hear that perhaps a stint as a producer on the Today programme may be in the offing. And I hope that statutory senility will not prevent you, my lady, from continuing to serve the public as you have done so marvellously for so many years. But of course, my lady, you may now have more time to devote to your recreations as listed in Who's Who of domesticity, drama and duplicate bridge. Thank you. <laughs> my Lord, on behalf of the Law Societies of England and Wales, of Scotland, and of Northern Ireland, it is my privilege to say a few words of thanks and to bid a very fond farewell to Baroness Hale. When your ladyship first asked me to speak today, I was frankly faint with delight. It is the honour of my life, but then immediately petrified. Um, how could I possibly do justice to your incredible career in a few minutes? So I will only focus on the enormous impact that you have had on women in the law and beyond. And of course, it's particularly apt that we celebrate your career and legacy just five days before the centenary of women being able to enter the legal profession. As the first woman to achieve so many prominent positions, you are a very, very powerful role model who has inspired countless women to believe that no part of the profession is beyond their reach. Speaking personally, you have been the inspiration for every step of my own career, from when, as a teenager in 1985, I first read your transformative book on women in the law, to the 1990s as a young children's rights lawyer, when the, that brilliant piece of child-centred legislation, which you've pretty much authored, the Children Act, was and continues to be our Bible. I remember the first time I heard you speak in 2005, inspiring, self-deprecating, and funny in equal measure. And I finally met you properly at the Law Society in 2014 when you gave an impassioned speech about women in the judiciary. And I've had the privilege of working alongside you on many occasions since then. I am so personally grateful for your leadership and your support. You inspired my career, my campaigning, and because of you, I, and I know for a fact, countless others in the legal profession have also been empowered to make a small dent for equality in our universe. You have consistently lived up to your own words. Pioneering women must champion the cause of women generally. We followed your wise lead, taken your words to heart and have tried to work out these values in our own lives. But 
In fact, you've made it really easy for us, never shying away from what needed to be said, but doing it in such an amiable and intellectually compelling way that it makes it difficult for anyone to disagree. <coughs> Let's take the case of greater diversity in our judiciary. Eloquent as ever, you argued that the judiciary should reflect the whole community, not just a small section of it. The public should be able to feel that the courts are their courts and that their cases are being decided and the law is being made by people like them and not by some alien beings from another planet. You've advocated the need for the judiciary to address gender inequality in its ranks, to ensure it stands for one of its core values, equality. But pragmatic as ever, you've been clear that the proper representation of women in the, the, in the judiciary is simply an efficient use of talent. And you've always been gracious and generous in your approach, quick to praise others, including those male champions who have been true allies in the fight for gender equality, those wonderful men who understood and who sympathised with our situation, as you said, you do not have to be a woman to be a feminist. You've been an inspiration for so many male lawyers as well. But your influence has, of course, extended far beyond our profession. Indeed, it's given birth to what has been dubbed the Brenda Agenda. Put simply, by you, that we should all enjoy the same rights and freedoms but that women's lives are necessarily sometimes different from men's. And the experience of leading those lives is just as valid and important in shaping the law as the experience of men's lives. The emphasis that you have placed on recognizing the unique perspectives and experiences of women in interpreting the law has brought both societal shift and real justice to countless women who have come before the courts. This fresh and welcome approach has seen you shape the law's understanding of the damage done to a woman by an unwanted pregnancy in Parkinson versus St. James and Seacross NHS Trust. Expand the definition of violence beyond the physical in Yenshaw versus Hounslow and redefine the realities of jointly owning a family home in Stack and Dowden. Seeing things from a woman's perspective and valuing that perspective has made a huge difference. And because of you, we have a more fairer, a more equal legal system. As a feminist, a lawyer and a leader, you have been a huge inspiration to so many of us. But I want to focus on your generosity of spirit, particularly towards the younger generation. A colleague of mine told me that when she brought a group of young Marshall scholars to the Supreme Court for a guided tour, once the tour had concluded, and at the end of a very long court day, to the scholars' absolute delight, you spent two hours with them, your genuine warmth and interest in their questions never waning for a moment. The kindness of your time is certainly not a one-off. Just this year, you've spoken at at least 54 events when you have been surrounded by students, junior and not-so-junior lawyers seeking to meet their hero. Your dear friend and PA, Ayo Onatade, also told me how you regularly get requests for work experience, mainly from young girls. And whilst formal shadowing isn't allowed, you invite as many as possible to come to the Supreme Court to spend a day with you. Indeed, this generosity will certainly be missed by those who have worked alongside you. I also spoke of her pride in working with you. The thoughtful flowers when moving to a new house and the nice telling off for working the odd late night. Your legacy, however, stretches far beyond the courtroom. Many will know that you are now the star of children's book, equal to everything, Judge Brenda and the Supreme Court. This book is about a little girl from Richmond who worked hard and eventually became the highest judge in the land. It highlights how Judge Brenda is very different from some other judges, being female, state educated, 
and having followed a non-traditional career path. I have no doubt it will inspire many children to dream and to plan for careers that they and their parents might not have thought possible. Of course, the fandom doesn't stop at literature. We can now all purchase our Lady Hale t-shirts, spider brooches, and girly swat necklaces. The respect and the warmth the legal profession has for you, Brenda, also known as Spider Woman, really cannot be underestimated. We thank you for being a pioneer, for the being the very best advert for women in the law and the judiciary, and for showing that women's presence in our legal system is not just a nice to have, but an absolute necessity to ensure that our experiences have equal weight in shaping the law. As someone who introduced children-centric legal decision-making to our society, I thought it was apt that we hear from the daughter of our dear mutual friend, Dana Denise Smith, who's the inspirational founder of the First 100 Years Project, something that you have long championed. Alma Constance, who is aged eight and who knows you really well, described you as a nice lady and very inspiring, kind, very thoughtful. She really thinks of other people and is very supportive. And that's spot on, as your legacy isn't just about your career feats, but a different type of leadership, full of integrity, of generosity and humanity. At a recent Law Society event organised to celebrate the centenary of women in the law, you finished your speech by saying that many old battles have been won, but there are plenty of new ones. And I'm sure I am not alone in eagerly anticipating the new challenges that you will now fearlessly turn to. Perhaps the follow-up children's book should be entitled, What Judge Brenda Did Next. <laughs> Whatever you do, count on our support. On behalf of the three law societies, may I wish you the very best for the future. The judiciary's loss will certainly be the legislature's gain. And we look forward to your motto of women are equal to everything, continuing to guide our respective work in campaigning for equality in the law, in the, in the judiciary and in our wider society. And finally, from one girly swat to another, and on behalf of all those girly swats in our country, in sisterhood, with great respect and with love, thank you. My lady, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was once asked, when will there be enough women in the US Supreme Court? And she replied, when there are nine. Of course, it's just a nine judge court. We've rightly heard a great deal this morning about your ladyship's many firsts. But let's not forget that you are also the last. Although Lord Kerr was appointed a month before the House of Lords uh, transformed itself, into the Supreme Court, he tells me that he was never allowed to give a judgment there. You are therefore the last real connection with Lord Bingham's House of Lords, the last of the Law Lords, which does sound a bit like an episode of Doctor Who. <laughs> My Lord, Doctor Who is a popular television program. <laughs> In that court, your judgments were seminal in the early years of the interpretation of the Human Rights Act. There are so many to choose from, but I recall in particular the case of Guyden and Godin Mendoza about the right to equality for single-sex couples. In your judgment in that case, you encapsulated in a single sentence the critical role of fundamental rights for the protection of minorities. You said this, democracy values everyone equally, even if the majority does not. As we've heard, in due course, you moved across Parliament Square 
And as it happens, you and I were both present on the very first hearing that ever took place in this building. It seems particularly fitting that that hearing concerned the rights of a child, the right to equality, to education, and to access to justice. The case had been brought by a boy who'd been refused a place at a Jewish school because his mother's conversion was not recognized by the religious authorities. The case raised difficult and fundamental questions about the meaning of discrimination. But the Legal Aid Board saw fit to threaten to withdraw the child's funding only weeks before the appeal was due to be heard. As a result, this court was urgently convened on the day before it had been due to open. And the first case it heard was not an appeal, but a judicial review of the Legal Aid Board. There are two things that I vividly remember about that hearing. The first is the expression on your ladyship's face when you read the letter from the Legal Aid Board in which they explained that they thought that the case wasn't terribly important because it would only affect the rights of a limited number of Jewish children. I have rarely seen such a silently eloquent expression of shock, disbelief and disgust. There was nothing more that needed to be said, so I sat down. <laughs> My lady, that moment for me exemplifies everything that you have stood for as a judge. Your empathy for the individuals whose often painful circumstances brought them before the court. Your utter lack of pomposity and the lightning speed with which you cut straight to the heart of the justice of the case. The second thing I remember about that hearing is that there were no lecterns for counsel in the newly opened court. So we very innocently put our boxes of papers on the desk so that we would have something to lean on while we were speaking. We were taken aside and told off immediately, very politely, and it was explained to us that Lady Hale had designed the court and would not tolerate messy pa papers on the desk. That rule still stands. It may yet prove to be your ladyship's most lasting legacy. <laughs> Along with your approval of the bold, perhaps even startling design of the carpet in this building, which still makes such a powerful impression on all who enter here that it formed the centerpiece of at least one barrister's submissions in the prorogation appeal. <laughs> My lady. When I was asked to speak this morning, I canvassed some of my beloved friends and colleagues in chambers, asking them to give me just three words to sum up uh, how it felt to appear in front of your ladyship. Naturally, in response, I received a series of long and densely written paragraphs because <laughs> barristers love the sound of their own voices, won't follow instructions, and can't keep to a time estimate. <laughs> but a few of the better disciplined ones did give me what I'd asked for. And here are some of the words that they used. Steely, focused, and fair. Tuned in, unifying, and kind. Humane, unpretentious, and fast. And finally, perceptive, polite, but no paper. It's the ban on the files still playing on the minds of the bar. But the qualities that my colleagues identified in your ladyship were, of course, on full view in September of this year in the prorogation appeal, watched by millions on the live feed. The contrast between the courteous, measured, and expert debate that took place here in that case and the tone and content of so much of our public discourse over recent months and years was dramatic and was not lost on the many viewers. My lady, the manner in which those proceedings were conducted and the manner in which they were determined was a personal triumph for you, as well as a testament to the quality of this court. One of the words my colleagues didn't use when they described you is a word I'm going to use now. It's the F word. In fact, it's three F words, my lady. It seems to me that far more significant than the fact that you're a woman 
is the fact that you're a feminist and a frank and fearless feminist. On many occasions, you have challenged the clever and kindly men who have surrounded you, both in the judiciary and at the bar, forcing them to question, often for the very first time, the assumptions, the stereotypes, and the perspectives that they have used all their lives and that have become second nature to them. For too many years, my lady, you have been a single-handed antidote to the ubiquitous male lens through which the law has traditionally been viewed. And we women of the bar have cheered you on. I hope very much that the distinguished women who now finally sit beside you in this beautiful and dignified court to which you have contributed so much in its first decade and the many more women who will follow in your footsteps in the decades to come will continue to carry that torch. Even if it does take 50 years until there are enough of them. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you all for your very kind words. I'll try and remember some of them. I think swashbuckling womanhood is going to um, <laughs> appear in a few of my uh, subsequent uh, speeches. But it is very important not to let things go to one's head. As judges, we know that there is always another side to the story from the one you've been hearing this morning. Not everyone thinks I'm such a good thing. This goes back at least to my law commission days. The law commissioners were pictured, not as enemies of the people, but as legal commissars subverting family values. And this was all because we had proposed, not that cohabiting couples should have the same rights as married ones, but that the same simpler, cheaper procedure should be available to resolve their property law disputes. Things went quieter in the High Court and the Court of Appeal, but they resurfaced when I went to the House of Lords. I was said to be quote, the most ideological, politically correct judge ever to have been appointed, end quote, and a hardline feminist, apparently intent on destroying the institution of marriage. And that was all because I had suggested that marriage was such a good thing that some of its benefits should be extended to the unmarried. Those same commentators didn't notice later when I defended the institution of marriage against the assaults of my male colleagues in a case called Radmacher and Granatino. <laughs> in 2004, my appointment was said to epitomize the moral vacuum within our judiciary and wider establishment. Why a commitment to gender equality at home and at work was thought to be a moral vacuum has never been clear to me. But more thoughtful commentators were also troubled. In Lord Hope's diaries, the entry for the 31st of December, 2003, records that, quote, a new team of Brenda Hale, Monday 12th January will be Hale Day, says Alan Roger, Bob Carswell and Simon Brown will inject a different atmosphere into the corridor. Of the three, Simon will keep up the spirit of good humor. Bob will drop neatly into Brian Hutton's shoes as our man from Northern Ireland. And Brenda will be a source of some anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> Until we adjust to the very different contribution she will make. I say now my grateful thanks to Lord Hope, who is in this room, for having given me that gift. <laughs> But you do have to feel a bit sorry for all those male institutions which have had to adjust to the very different contribution that women might, not necessarily would, make. But adjust the law lords did. Of course, some stereotyping lived on. Why else was I put in charge of art and interiors when we moved into this building, while others were in charge of the more serious business of funding, staffing and security? But of course, I'm very glad about that because I cared about how our building looked and I think that we have achieved something really special here. And the architect, Elsie Uwusu, with her team, deserves all our thanks, together with the brilliant artists who played their part. 
And now we have the wonderful new artwork by Catherine Yass in Courtroom 2, which I do urge you all to go and have a look at if you haven't already seen it, which commemorates the progress of women in the law over the last century and goes some small way to counterbalance the weight of all those dead white men we are obliged but happy to continue to co commemorate. There are many reasons to be grateful to my fellow judges, the law lords in the House of Lords and the justices in the Supreme Court. They are so open-minded and so unpredictable. <laughs> we go into our post-hearing deliberations not knowing what the others are going to say. Well, sometimes. We do not know one another's political opinions, although occasionally we may have a good guess, and long may that remain so. Judges have not been appointed for party political reasons in this country since at least the Second World War. We do not want to turn into the Supreme Court of the United States, whether in powers or in process of appointment. On the other hand, we do have an idea of one another's approach to judging and to the law, but we are often surprised. Everyone is persuadable. So I give thanks, especially to those I have managed to persuade over the years. <laughs> the decisions of which I have been the most proud over those years, some of which have been mentioned this morning, have been unanimous ones. And of course, I commiserate with those of you whom I wasn't able to persuade. I'm also grateful to the staff who've helped to keep me in order over the years. As a trial judge, the two most important people in your life are your usher and your clerk. Our ushers in this court are also important, although they may not have quite the range of challenges which ushers in first instance judges have to face. In Court 45 in the Royal Courts of Justice, I had the amazing red-haired glamorous granny, Pat Jeffries, as my usher. In the House of Lords, we had our wonderful doorkeepers, Jackie and John. They readily agreed to my suggestion that when the law lords appeared on the committee corridor to confront the assembled barristers before going into the committee room ahead of them, they should shout, their lordships and her ladyship, <laughs> instead of just their lordships. Lenny Hossman whispered, whispered to me when we got in, well done, Brenda. <laughs> Sadly, there are still counsel in this court who fail to realize that they are addressing a mixed bench. I do not mind whether they address the presider in the singular, my lord or my lady, or the bench in the collective, my lords and my ladies. But I do not think that in this day and age, a mixed bench, which is not wearing robes, should be addressed as my lords. I have had two long-serving clerks, Barbara Cogene in the family division and Ayo Onatade in the Court of Appeal and is now my PA in this court. They have become good friends. I thank them both for always making me feel that they liked working with me, despite my idiosyncrasies, because I know that I can be difficult, and that there are women who find working for women harder than working for men. But Barbara and Io have never given a hint of that, and I'm grateful, so grateful to you both. I've had many more judicial assistants because they mostly change at least once a year. In the Court of Appeal and House of Lords, I was a junior judge, so didn't feel entitled to ask much of the assistant assigned to me. But for the last few years, I have had the assistance of the incomparable Penelope Gorman, also retiring from the court at the end of this year. One of the most competent lawyers I have ever encountered, and I know that others share that view, but also one of the most self-effacing. She has resisted all efforts to turn her into something grander than one of the JA's team. But I, for one, will never forget the help that she has been to me. Of course, ushers, personal assistants, and judicial assistants are not the only people with whom we work. We are a small organization, and all our staff are important. But I want to say a special thank you to Mark Ormrod, our chief executive during my presidency, and Jenny Rowe, who set the organization up and devised so much of our arrangements, often in the face of a hostile civil service. So thank you, Jenny. Last, but of course not least, can I thank my family. 
my wonderful husband, my frog prince, who said all those years ago that he wanted me with my future, when neither of us knew what that would be, and who has never, ever tried to influence my decisions, not even in Scott and South Pacific mortgages, <laughs> where the finance company which had been tricked out of its money was preferred to the owner who had been tricked out of her home, which he has described as possibly the worst ever decision the Supreme Court has made. <laughs> Without his support and encouragement, I would probably never have embarked on a judicial career. So he has a lot to answer for. There are also the next two generations, our children and our grandchildren, who are here today, some of them. They are exemplars of careers we never knew existed when we were young and our greatest delight. If Judge Brenda has inspired a younger generation to believe in the ideals of justice, fairness and equality, and to think that they might put them into practice, Judge Brenda will retire content. So can I end by wishing you all a very happy and a peaceful Christmas. Thank you. Now adjourn. <laughs>